This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. So first of all, uh, I'd like to express uh, that you know it's an it's an honor for VNS and and for myself and and the team to have you as a speaker. You are and you have been a supporter of VNS, a very significant supporter for a certain number of years, but not just VNS, but as well a range of cultural institutions around the world. So we, I think the field uh, has to be extremely, well, needs to be very grateful about your commitment uh, and your philanthropic endeavors. So if I can summarize a little bit, um, Rick, your parents were a high school teacher and um, they traveled a lot around the world, which is, which is how your interest for numismatics uh, appeared. And if I am correct, it's during a trip to Istanbul where you bought a, a late Roman coin that as a teenager, your interest for Roman coinage grew uh, and will later develop. Uh, into the, pa the passion we know uh, today. Um, in order to um, explain how you have been able to help a field like this, one needs to know that <clears throat> you went to UCLA Business School and then you worked for 25 years with Capital Group, which is how you could reach a point where you could build a collection, I mean, financially speaking, and at the same time, um, commit yourself to your philanthropic endeavors. And uh, it, it seems that your love for museum and maybe ancient history comes from your mother, who would not miss any museum during, during your travels. Um, you have been a trustee at VNS between 2011 and 2016, and a fellow since 2018. You were honored at VNS Gala in 2020. And uh, since then, your support to VNS has been steadfast. So, without further ado, and uh, well, it's uh, your um, your turn to animate this long table number uh, almost two hundred. I think we are very close to the two hundred mark for our long tables. Thank you, Rick, for your uh, participation, and we we are listening to you now. Well, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be in Zoom land. As you know from the introduction, I am Richard Bellison, and I've been a long-term member of the ANS. As was mentioned, I purchased my first ancient coin in 1964 when I was 10 years old. I'm now 70 years old. I purchased it in the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul when it was legal. If I did it today, I'd be in the sequel to the Midnight Express. <laughs> and after I purchased that coin, when I came back to the United States, I took it to the ANS, which was at Audubon Terrace, and I had it identified. It was a coin of Constantius II with the emperor spearing the fallen horseman. So that is when my relationship with the ANS began. And I've I've had wonderful experiences both at Audubon Terrace and the other locations of the ANS. And on the trip in 1964, uh, my family is Jewish, so we also went to Israel and we went to Jerusalem and Caesarea and Tel Aviv. And we went into an antiquity shop in Tel Aviv which is where I actually saw my first ancient coins. I saw a legionary denarius of Mark Anthony and a Judea capta denarius of Vespasian. I would have very much liked to have them, but at the time, uh, my mother was unwilling to shell out the shekels to buy them. But I did not manage to get this little bronze coin in Istanbul. So, uh, my fascination with ancient coins is tied into my fascination with history. And so without the history, the coins wouldn't really have the meaning they have. And that's what the topic is going to be on, uh, historically fascinating uh, coin minted in Judea. I'd also like to preface my remarks by saying I'm just a collector. I'm not a, an academic scholar. So this presentation will 
be focused from a collector's perspective. I just hope for uh, the academic scholars that are on the call uh, that uh, my level of presentation will still capture your interest. So the coin I'm going to be talking about is reference to David Hendon as 6278 in his sixth edition of his book, Guide to Biblical Coins. And if you go to Roman Provincial Coins online, it's 4982, and it's a coin of Herod Agrippa I, who reigned from 37 to 44 CE. And this presentation is a compilation on all the coins that I'm aware of. I don't know what I don't know. Uh, here is a line drawing of the coin. I'm going to get into details about the coin further on in the presentation, but this first slide gives you a line drawing of it. And I want to give credit to Professor Andreas Kropp at the University of Nottingham because this is his line drawing. And I will get into the specifics. But first, I want to talk about the history related to the coin. So I'll start by saying, did you know the last Jewish king of Judea was named after Mark Anthony? Julius Caesar, and Marcus Agrippa. His name was Marcus Julius Agrippa. Bet you didn't know that was a nice Jewish name. And he was the grandson of Herod the Great. Uh, we know him historically as Herod Agrippa I. He was born in 10 to 11 BCE and reigned from 37 to 44 CE, and he passed away in 44 CE. Now, let's see, I have to get this moving. So, uh, Herod Agrippa carried the bloodlines of both the Herodians and the Hasmoneans. Uh, Herod himself married a Hasmonean princess, so his descendants would carry both Herodian and Hasmonean blood. His father was the son of Aristobulus. Was the, his father was Aristobulus, who was the son of Herod. And he was actually killed by his grandfather. Uh, Herod killed his son Aristobulus when Agrippa was only five years old. And, you know, Augustus was quoted as saying, better to be Herod's pig than his son, because Herod had this nasty habit of being paranoid about his relatives and killing them. He also killed his wife, Marianne. So Herod's mother, Herod Agrippa's mother, Berenice, decided it would be best for him to take him to Rome to be out of the reach of his grandfather. So he actually grew up in Rome among the Julio-Claudian children because the Herodians and the Julio-Claudians were actually personal friends. And if you watch any of these dramas like I, Claudius or the HBO Rome, uh, you'll see Herodians uh, in some of the episodes. So growing up with the Julio-Claudian children would serve Herod Agrippa to his advantage. When he was a young man, he was friends with Gaius, whom we know as Caligula. Uh, they'd hang out together, they'd go drinking together, and they were at one time uh, riding in a chariot together. And Agrippa mentioned to Gaius that uh, he wished that he was the emperor rather than his uncle Tiberius. And the chariot driver overheard the comment and reported it to Tiberius, who was upset, so he had Agrippa arrested and imprisoned. But as it turned out, six months later, Tiberius had died, uh, Caligula became the emperor, and Agrippa was released from prison. He was given chains of gold to replace his iron chains from prison. He was appointed a praetor, and he was given his deceased uncle Philip's old tetrarchy north of Galilee. Now, uh, when Caligula gave Agrippa this tetrarchy, uh, the wife of Herod Antipas got upset. She was a social climber, and she wanted her husband, Herod Antipas, to have more and more territory. So she complained to her husband, you've got to go and talk to Caligula. And he went and he talked to Caligula, 
and he annoyed Caligula so much that uh, he was banned to the uh, city of Vienne in Gaul, and Caligula then gave Antipas's territory, which was the Galilee, to Agrippa. Now, as it turns out, Agrippa was actually in Rome when Caligula got assassinated. And as you know, there was pandemonium and the Praetorian guards who had assassinated Caligula uh, found Claudius hiding behind a curtain and they decided that he would be a good candidate for the next emperor. And they took him to the Praetorian camp proclaiming him as the next emperor. But they also had to get the Senate to buy into their selection. And it turned out that Agrippa had good relations with both the commanders of the Praetorian Guard and the Senate, and he was a go-between in these negotiations that led to Claudius being proclaimed emperor. And Claudius was very appreciative of Agrippa, and so he conferred on him the consular rank, and he expanded his domains to include Judea and Samaria. So he essentially had the same territories as Herod the Great. And Agrippa asked Claudius to award his older brother, his name was Herod as well, the kingdom of Chalcus. And so Claudius uh, gave Chalcus to his brother, and he's known as Herod of Chalcus. Uh, this is a map I found in a book by Mel Wax, who I believe is an ANS member in LA. It's called The Handbook of Biblical Numismatics. Uh, I didn't ask Mel for permission. I hope he's okay with my using this map. It's a great map. I like it because it's color-coded, so I can point out the various territories I've been discussing. The ones in yellow are the territories initially given to Agrippa. These are the ones that Philip ruled. Then there's a kind of lighter shade of green where you can see Galilee, and that's what Herod Antipas had that was given by Caligula to Agrippa. Then the dark green, you see Judea and Samaria. So that's what Claudius gave to uh, Agrippa in 41. And then at the top, you see the uh, orange, that's Chalcus, which was given to Herod of Chalcus. Now, Agrippa was loyal to Rome, but he was also loyal to his Jewish roots. And if you read the text, he is praised in both the writings of Flavius Josephus and in the Talmud. However, during his reign, the apostle James was executed. The apostle Peter was imprisoned with the intention of his being executed, though he escaped. So in the New Testament, Agrippa uh, does not get the positive of public relations. Uh, he reigned for seven years. He died in Caesarea in 44 CE, possibly of poisoning. And his, at the time, his son, also named Herod Agrippa, we would know him as Herod Agrippa II, he was only 16 years old. Uh, so initially, he was not made king. Eventually, he was, but only of the northern territories, the territories that Herod Philip and Herod Antipas had ruled. Upon the death of Herod Agrippa I, Judea was thenceforth governed by a procurator. So this blew my mind when I thought about it. Herod Agrippa I was the last Jewish ruler of Judea until Israel's independence in 1948, a period of 1,904 years. So. You get trivia co question, a uh, contest. Who was the uh, Jewish ruler or leader of uh, what we call Israel prior to David Ben-Gurion on May 14th of 1948? You have to go back to 44 CE to Herod Agrippa I. And his reign was considered a golden era. So now let's discuss the coinage of Herod Agrippa. He issued different coinages for his non-Jewish and his predominantly Jewish populations and territories. Uh, so the territories that Herod Philip and Herod Antipas uh, ruled that he was given would have more uh, non-Jews than, uh, say, Judea and Samaria. 
but even Samaria would have a lot of non-Jews. So uh, the non-Jewish coinage was minted in Caesarea Pontius, that would have been Herod of Philip's territory, in years two and five of his reign. So years 38, 39 CE and 40, 41 CE. And in Caesarea Maritima, which is in Samaria, in years seven and eight of his reign, which would be 42, 43 CE and 43, 44 CE. And because these were minted in non-Jewish territories, they bear graven images, and they're also relatively rare. And the coin designs are influenced by the designs on contemporary Roman imperial coinage. His Jewish coinage, minted in Judea, depicts an umbrella-like canopy and three ears of barley. It was only minted in year six, which is 4142 CE in Judea, it's of a Prutot denomination, and they are exceedingly common. So let's look at these coins. And if you see a coin with a red background, that is from my collection. So this is from my collection. So this is Herod Agrippa I, and it was minted in Pontius, and it's hand in 6268. The obverse bust of Agrippa looking right, and the reverse is his son, Agrippa II, uh, on a horse. And this coin is heavily influenced by this Roman coin uh, minted by Caligula. It shows his brothers, Nero and Jesus Caesar, mounted uh, on horses. And here, if I put the two side by side, uh, I'm convinced that the, the Roman coin influenced the design of uh, the coin of Agrippa I. Uh, here is another coin of Herod Agrippa I. Uh, these coins typically come in inferior condition. Uh, sometimes you can find one in better condition than this, but most of them kind of look uh, as this one does. So I'm just happy to have it. And this I got from uh, a collection of Ken Abramowitz, who has an amazing collection, and he was upgrading, so I was able to get his coin. And it's got a uh, bust of Caligula facing left, and Germanicus and a quadriga on the right. And if you can get one of these with a good inscription, on the reverse it says, uh, Nomos Basileus Agrippa, so coin of King Agrippa. But it's really hard to find one of those, and they go for a fortune. Uh, here's the Roman coin I believe it's based on. By the way, there are two people who have entered the reading room. Uh, this is the Roman coin it's based on, which is the Dupondius issued by uh, Caligula, uh, depicting Germanicus on the Quadriga. And here you put the two side by side, and I think it's compelling that the Roman coin influenced design of the Jewish coin. Other coins minted by Herod Agrippa I, this is one depicting the wife of Caligula, Caesona, on the obverse, and on the reverse is his sister, Drusilla. Uh, this is a very rare coin. I was absolutely thrilled to get it. Uh, bust of Agrippa facing right on the obverse and his wife, Kipros, standing on the reverse. Uh, really hard coin to get. Now let's look at the coins minted in Caesarea Maritima. So this is a coin minted in 42 to 43. Uh, the bust of Claudius facing right is on the obverse, and you've got a counter, st counter stamp of a Julio Claudian bust facing left on this coin. And you find a lot of these coins counter stamped. This is my coin, it's from the Bromberg collection. Uh, you know, and once again, these are hard to find in great condition, but to tell you what's there, I'll show you a better example later on, but I wanted to use the coin for my collection for this presentation. But uh, you've got four figures underneath a dial style temple, and it looks like there's a sacrifice scene going on. I mentioned the influence of Roman imperial coins. This is a Sturcius of Caligula that came out in 40 to 41 AD. And if you look at the reverse, you see a very similar dial style sacrifice scene. Here, if I put them side by side, uh, you can see the similarities. 
Obviously, if my coin was in better condition, it would be more apparent. But I will show you a coin in better condition, and then it will become apparent. Uh, here's another coin of Agrippa the first. Agrippa uh, the first facing right on the obverse with a countermark obscuring part of his uh, face. And on the reverse, you've got Tyche with a rudder. This is a very rare coin. It depicts a crib of the second facing left and an inverted anchor. And once again, very rare, so tough to get. But I would point out that this coin came from the collection of Teddy Kollek, who was the mayor of Jerusalem. So I'm thrilled to have a coin from his collection. This is the coin I'm going to be talking about in detail. Uh, but I'm just going to briefly mention it here that you've got a coin that shows Herod Agrippa and his brother Herod of Chalcis crowning Claudius with wreaths on the on the one side of the coin and clasped hands with an inscription on the other side of the coin. And here is a Sistiforus of Claudius. And once again, talking about the influence of uh, the design of the coins based on Roman imperial coins, here you've got the emperor being crowned with a wreath. And if we put the two scenes side by side, uh, you can see the similarities. Now let's talk about the one coin minted in Jerusalem. Here you've got uh, umbrella-like canopy and ears of barley. So this is a very, very common coin. Now I'd like to talk about the feature coin of this presentation. And as I've mentioned, the history tied into the coins is really important to me. I think if there was a Hall of Fame for historically interesting coins, uh, this would be in the Hall of Fame, including with the eyes of Mars Denarius, uh, because this coin directly references an actual historical event that occurred. And let's go into that history. We have the writings of Josephus, Flavius Josephus, and Suetonius, and they talk about these events. In 41 CE, the Emperor Claudius issued an edict confirming the kingdoms of both Herod Agrippa and his brother Herod of Chalcis and expanding the territories under Agrippa's domain. And in conjunction with this edict, a ceremony was held in Rome, announcing a treaty of friendship and alliance between King Agrippa, King Herod of Chalcis, the Emperor Claudius, and the Senate and people of Rome. And that's what the coin shows. Uh, we'll get to the coin. There are actually two other related coins that were minted, and I'll discuss them as well. Uh, another one minted in Caesarea Maritima. It's the coin that we've seen with the die style temple. Uh, it has four figures in it. One is Herod Agrippa. Uh, one is Claudius. Two other figures. There's one in the background who appears to be holding the treaty and one in the foreground that's kneeling and perhaps sacrificing a pig. And this scene depicts a ceremony referred to by both Josephus and Suetonius. There's a third coin by Herod Agrippa's brother, Herod of Chalcis, and it shows Herod of Chalcis and Herod Agrippa crowning Claudius with a wreath, and it refers to Claudius on inscription in the reverse. And we'll see that coin as well. And this is the reference that Flavius Josephus makes to uh, this event, this edict uh, by Claudius and the, the treaty uh, placed on a bronze tablet and dedicated in the Capitolum. And Andrew Burnett, who is a scholar, discusses these events as well. And I won't go into the detail here, but he gives you all the discussion about the ceremony that took place in the forum. And though it's not directly referred to, it's implied that there was a sacrifice in the temple as well. So remember, uh, these are Jewish kings and uh, you know they're not going to be uh, open to uh, sacrifices of pigs and 
uh, with the Jewish population, but with their non-Jewish populations, they certainly could uh, have references to this event. So let's look at the coin in more detail. This is the side with the three kings. And this coin, it turns out, the one example with the date, it's year eight. There may be examples with year seven, but we can't see the date on any of the coins for year seven. So here you've got King Agrippa, that's Herod Agrippa, the first, on the left, crowning Claudius with a wreath. And his brother, King Herod of Chalcis, on the right, crowning Claudius with a wreath. And there is Claudius. He is in the toga. He's veiled, and he's got a patera to make a sacrifice. And that particular scene of the head covered is uh, referred to as capite volato. And you'll see that on coins and sculptures. So there you got it, King Herod. Augustus Caesar, King Agrippa, Augustus Caesar, and King Herod. That's the inscription on that side of the coin. And as I mentioned, there's one example showing the date. If you look at this coin in the exurge, you'll see LH, and that is for uh, year eight, I guess, uh, Lambda Eta. And going back to what I said about Capite Volato being depicted on coins and sculptures, if we go back to this Asturias of Caligula, there is the emperor in Capite Volato. It looks identical to the coin on Herod Agrippa I. And there is a beautiful sculpture of the emperor in Capite Volato. Now let's turn to the class pan side of the coin. And this is the inscription that just, I find absolutely incredible. You've got class hands of friendship, and you've got a circular inscription, an outer inscription, and an inner inscription. And it's translated to say, a vow and treaty of friendship and alliance between the great King Agrippa and Augustus Caesar, the Senate, and the people of Rome. This is what Josephus and Suetonius refer to. Now, if you actually look at the inscription and what the words mean, and the first one, it's like Orchia, Oath, Boss, King, May, Great, Agrippa, so Great King Agrippa with an oath, uh, Seb, uh, Augustus, Caesar, Caesar, then Sincatom, uh, that is uh, the Senate. So that's the outer wreath. And inside the inner wreath, uh, I'm going to butcher the, the, the uh, pronunciation, but the Kidmo, that's uh, people, the Delta, Eta, um, Mu, uh, Omicron, that's the, the people, like democracy. There's the word for democracy, really. Then Rome, so people of Rome, Philly, friends, he's Maxi, allies, and Atoy, his. So his friends and allies. So uh, I find this to be an incredibly fascinating inscription, the most historically interesting, in my opinion. And one thing about this side, the clasped hand side, uh, they frequently are countermarked with this Julio-Claudian bust facing left. And on the 25 examples I found, 18 of them are countermarked. Once again, just to review the inscriptions, Obverse, King Agrippa, Augustus Caesar, King Herod, and the reverse, uh, a vow and treaty of friendship and alliance between the great King Agrippa and Augustus Caesar, the Senate, and the people of Rome. Show me a more fascinating inscription on an ancient coin. As I had mentioned, uh, the countermark appears frequently, and it's always on the clasped hand side. 
all these countermarks have been cataloged by Chris Haugigo, who's at the Ashmolean Museum, and he's published a book about it. Uh, this is just for Greek imperial or Roman provincial countermarks, and they all have a number. So this is GIC, Greek imperial countermark 156. And I read about the significance of the countermarks and their various hypotheses. I just decided to say, the actual significance of the countermark is unknown. There are multiple possibilities. Leave it at that. Now, I'm going to make a proposal, and I'd be very curious as to people's reactions to my proposal, the Q&A. On all the other coins of Herod Agrippa I, the countermark appears on the bus side of the coin. You never see the countermark on the reverse, the non-bus side. This coin doesn't have a bus side. Consequently, because the countermark only appears on the clasped hand side of the coin, I'm going to propose that perhaps the clasped hand side of the coin is the obverse. So I know usually you can tell obverse from reverse by the manufacturer because the obverse would be in the anvil. But I'm just wondering if on this coin, maybe you can tell that, I have to, the experts look at it, but I wonder if the, the front side of the coin is not the clasped hand side, because it's the only side that gets countermarked, and all the other grip of the first coins that are countermarked, it's on the bus side. So food for thought. Now there are other, there are two other coins related to this ceremony. This is Hendon 6275. There are two different dates for this coin that have been found. As I said, we only have the LH date for uh, the year eight for the first coin I showed you, the Hendon 6278. This coin we've got for year seven and year eight. So you've got RPC 4983 for year seven and RPC 4984 for year eight. This is the one with bust of Agrippa facing right. I mean, bust of Claudius facing right. And this is the best one I found. And here you've got the Capite Valato sacrifice scene uh, with the die style temple. And here you can clearly see uh, Agrippa on the left. You've got Capite Valato uh, with Claudius on the right with the Patera. In the background, you see uh, a third figure holding up something. This could be the bronze tablet with the treaty on it. And beneath there's a fourth character and you could possibly be doing a sacrifice. So this is the best example I found. And once again, going back to Capite Bellato, you can clearly see the influence of the Cistercius of Caligula. And this is the third coin. This is a coin minted by Herod of Calchas, a uh, very rare coin. There are just a handful of these. And the obverse looks very similar to his brother Agrippa's coin, only he gives himself the uh, desirable being on the left side. This says King Herod, Herod of Calchas on the left side, and then King Agrippa on the right side. And there's Claudius and Capite Bellato, uh in between them. And in the excerpt, it refers to Claudius. And the reverse inscription has no class pans. It just has an inscription referring to Claudius and the year. So those are the three coins that relate to this specific event, this treaty between the Herods and uh, the emperor and the Senate and people of Rome. So now I'm going to talk about coins by appearance in Roman provincial coins. And as I said, these coins are rare. I might even say they're incredibly rare. In 2013, when Andreas Kropp wrote his and published his article, he knew of seven examples, with six of those being in museums and one in a private collection. In 2014, when Andrew Burnett published his article, it included 10 examples, six in museums and four in private collections. Now, I want to say it wasn't that three coins were discovered between 2013 and 2014. 
those three coins had existed and were in private collections in 2013. It's just a scholar may not necessarily know about a coin that's in a private collection. Andreas Krop was unaware of them and Andrew Burnett was aware of them. So that explains the number seven going to the number 10. Now, in preparation for this report, I looked at coin archives and I talked to dealers. And in my contendium, I have 25 known examples, including the six big museums. There may be more out there, but as I said, I only know what I know about. And these are the articles that I referred to with the seven examples in 2013 and the 10 examples in 2014. Now, with the advent of metal detectors, uh, more coins are being found. I mean, the, the one example we all are very much aware of is how the coins of Aristobulus and Salome were incredibly rare and very expensive. And now uh, they, um, whether or not I can say they're common, they're certainly much less rare than they used to be. So what I have here is a uh, compendium of coins appearing in auction catalogs or on the market uh, since 2007. So you'll see uh, two appeared in 2007. Then you get to 2013 and 2014 and 2015, one coin appeared in the market each of those years. You get to 2018, one coin appeared. 2019, one. 2020, two. 2021, three. None in 2022, three again in 2023, and two in 2024. So I'm guessing that over time, uh, these will become uh, more available. That's what this pattern suggests to me. Uh, and so while they're incredibly rare now, a few years from now, uh, maybe they won't be. But as of now, I've only been able to identify 25 coins, six in museums and 19 uh, either on the market and private collections. And right now on V coins, there are two that are available for sale. So let's look at all these coins. These are the first six that were in museums. This is one in the Bank of Israel. And one thing you'll notice, once again, these coins do not appear in great condition. So if this was the first one that was known, you can see you don't have a complete inscription. If you're in the numismatist trying to figure out what's the inscription on this coin, you've got to make some educated guesses. But as more examples turn up, then you can get a better sense as to what the actual inscription is. So this was the Bank of Israel coin. Then you've got the one in the Bibliothèque Nationale. Here's RPC3. This is a pontifical uh, associated uh, museum in Jerusalem, a uh, Franciscan Bible Museum, I guess you could say. And they have two coins, and this is one here. You can hardly see any inscription. And this is the second one they have. Here is RPC-5. This is the Cadman Numismatic Pavilion in Tel Aviv. Uh, this coin is uh, certainly uh, hard to decipher any inscription. And then here's the second one in the Cadman. And on this one, you've got a lot of inscription on the class pan side that you can see. So. For many, many years, these were the six coins known. Now let's go to coins with sales records. Uh, and there are actually uh, 19 coins uh, with sales records. And this is the first one. It's RPC-7. For some reason, it's also RPC-15. Maybe after this presentation, it'll only be RPC-7 and RPC-15 will disappear. But this is uh, the Samo coin. The Samo collection was sold in 2020. But for a long time, this is the only coin in a private collection for which academic scholars were aware of its existence. And then, as I've said, with the metal detecting and so forth, more coins uh, reached the market. More coins became available for RPC to catalog. And now we look at the other uh, coins 
uh, in the marketplace that are now cataloged in RPC. This is a spectacular coin. It showed up in the Triton catalog that was auctioned on January 8, 2019. Uh, beautiful coin. I'm not sure if that's Claudius or E.T., uh, but that's the uh, depiction of the three kings. And a lot of inscription, uh, nice, strong strike. And as you can see, it went for $30,000, which is kind of like a wow price. Uh, but it's beautiful. It's a great coin. And that became RPC-8. And then there are others. Now, this coin, uh, I'm going to show you two versions of it. Uh, this is currently for sale by Athena, Athena Numismatics, and it's got an orange and black patina. But here it is. It was in the Roma sale in 2018, unsold, and it had a green patina. And you know, it is listed in RPC. Uh, I'm just a collector. I'm not a scholar or a dealer. I don't know. I have questions about this coin. And the fact that it doesn't have die links and there's something stylistically about it and it's perfectly centered, it, it, it raises questions in my mind. But uh, I'll leave it at that. It is listed as RPC-9. RPC-10 uh, was in a Goldberg sale. As you can see, it's a coin in uh, not the greatest condition. It was in the collection of Patrick Tan, who's very passionate about collecting biblical coins. Here's RPC-11. Once again, you know, the condition, this is what these coins come in. Uh, they're not going to win beauty contests, and it's been sold twice. RPC-12 uh, went for a pretty hefty price, given its appearance, in my opinion. There is no RPC-13. Maybe RPC is superstitious. Uh, here's RPC-14. Uh, I believe that this coin has uh, gone through conservation, revealing more of its inscription. And you can see a full inscription on the obverse, or, or let's say on the three kings side, maybe that's the reverse, as I proposed. Uh, full inscription on the three kings side, and you can see clearly the whole inner ins circle inscription on the clasped hand side and a lot of the outer inscription. Once again, here is the Samuel coin. It's already RPC7, but it's also listed as RPC. 15. And the corrosion on the clasped hand side is actually where there's a counter stamp. Obviously, there's a lot of corrosion on the on, well, the, on the three king side as well. I have to, have to get out of that saying three obverse. I don't know if it's the obverse or the reverse. This is a funky looking coin, RPC 16. You might even wonder, is it real? But there's actually a die link. So this is an authentic coin. Uh, just very funky looking. Uh, this is RPC 17. The three kings side is off center, but clearly you have a lot of the inscription for uh, you can see clearly King Agrippa on the on the three kings side, and on the reaver on uh, the class hand side, uh, you can see a fair amount of inscription too. RPC 18. Uh, this is uh, another example with a counter mark. Uh, there is no RPC-19. Don't ask me why. Uh, here's RPC-20. So twice. And then uh, this is that one example that is dated. It's got the lambda, eta in the exurge on the three kings side. And I remember... The Superior Auction in 1995. I was driving up to Vermont and I actually stopped roadside to phone in to make a bid, but I didn't get it. Uh, it subsequently showed up in this uh, Deutsch sale in 2007, and I heard that it didn't sell. I would love to know where it is because I think it, having the only dated example would be nice to know where it is. And uh, this is RPC-22, also from that Deutsch sale, and apparently it didn't sell either. If anybody knows where these coins are, uh, I'd love to know. 
So that coin's not in RPC. Uh, this is a coin that is for sale right now. And if I were in the market for one, I would prefer to buy this one over the Athena one. That's just my opinion. Uh, for one thing, it's a third of the price. But I think it's a very nice coin. You got the three kings. You got a lot of inscription. The clefts hand side, you got the full uh, inner circle inscription. The interesting thing about this coin is it actually appeared uh, earlier. It appeared in a CNGE sale and it hadn't been conserved. You can see what it looks like. You can barely see any inscription. Uh, and now that it's been conserved and all the credit in the world, whoever did the conservation, they did a really nice job you can see the inscription. So uh, that's a nice one. If anyone is inspired after my presentation, here, just contact Terry. Uh, this is a another example that came on the market uh, this year through Sol Numismatics. Uh, and it's got a counter stamp on the class hand side. Pretty nice coin. Uh, this is a coin that has actually been for sale twice this year. It uh, was in the Triton 27 online portion of the sale in January, where presumably it hammered for $4,000, but it mysteriously appeared in Naval Numismatics uh, in August, where it sold for $2,100. This is the coin that I acquired in 1994 from David Hendon, who uh, is a good friend of mine. I was so thrilled when he called me and said, I found one for you. And as you can see, it's very corroded. I didn't care. I was just so thrilled and so happy uh, to get this coin. And uh, it's still, it's tremendously emotional to me. I'm so attached to it because it's a symbol not just of uh, my collection, but of my friendship with David. And I love this coin. And this is another coin that David provided me a photograph of. It's in a private collection. And the last one, this is a coin that appeared in the New York sale in 2023. And uh, it looks like a very nice coin to me. It had a $15,000 estimate. I think given that the Trident coin had sold for 30,000, in 2019, uh, this one looks pretty good. And I think that the, the, whoever can sign it was hoping to get a similar price. And I'm a little surprised that it didn't even sell. And I, once again, I wonder where it is because to me, it looks like a really nice coin. So uh, those are the ones I'm aware of. I found records of 19 coins in the trade or private collections. Uh, 17 appeared in auctions and two private sale coins, and then the six coins in institutional collections, so a total of 25. Now, RPC lists 20 coins, but one appears to be a duplicate. That's the Samuel coin, which is listed as 7 and 15. And then there are six coins that are in the trade and private collections that do not appear in RPC. And by the way, RPC is not obligated to uh, include every coin ever minted. So whether or not these will be added to RPC, who knows? And then there are two coins currently for sale on V coins, what I label as RPC9, which is the uh, Athena coin and not RPC1. But these are the only ones I know. If anybody listening, watching this knows of any other coins, I would love to hear about them. I want to discuss uh, the coins appearing in books. As I said, they were very rare. Very few of them were known. Eight of them are now uh, published in books. So you go back to 1967, Meshorer, Jewish coins of the Second Temple period. This is the coin from the uh, Studium Biblicum Franciscanium. This is the coin not in great condition, but one of the few that he knew about. And he knew about the Bibliotheque National coin, but he only had a line drawing of it. He didn't have a photograph. And he had two different versions of the line drawing. So in 67, these are the coins that Marshall knew about. How about in 82? 
In 82, he knew about the Samo coin, so that's published. And once again, he knew about the BNF coin. And he knew now about the Bank of Israel coin. So now you're talking about three coins that were known. You go to Malkiel Gerstenfield from 1982. This is the Samo coin. And on this one, you can actually see much better the countermark on the class hand side. You go to 2001, Mesherer, and he's got uh, the Samo coin, and he's got the BNF coin. Now, if you go to David Hendon's book, The Fifth Edition in 2010, there's the Samo coin. You go to the sixth edition, he's got the Samo coin and also this beautiful coin that was in Triton 22. So in summary, uh, these are the academic references you might want to look at, two by Andrew Burnett and two by Andreas Prop. Now, I also attempted to do uh, dialects, and I found it just too challenging with the uh, three emperors side, three kings side. Uh, so I leave that to the experts to spend time looking at these 25 coins, the dialects with the three kings side. With the clasped hand side, it's easier for an amateur like me to attempt it because you can look at the uh, positioning of the inscriptions versus the clasped hands. So I focused on what I call the right wrist of the clasped hand, and I looked at the lettering in relationship to the right wrist. And I came up with seven dies. So uh, let's look at those. So this one, I'm talking about the Omega uh, from the Rho Omega Mu for Rome on the right wrist. And the Omega is centered on the wrist. So if you look, there's the Omega. There's the Omega. So these two look like a reverse of a clasped hands die die link. And there's the one coin, and there's the other coin. This is the one that has the date and the X urge on the three kings side. A second die, now you've got the row of the row omega mu, uh, and you've got that centered on the wrist at three o'clock. And there are 10 of these. So here's one, once again, there's the row. You can see it's at three o'clock. Second coin, uh, you gotta spend a lot of time looking at it, but the, the row is centered on three o'clock. Uh, another one in that category, the fourth one here, you can clearly see the row at three o'clock. Here, I think, uh, it looks like it. I was spending a lot of time, you know, is the Omega or is the row at three o'clock? And I think this is the row at three o'clock. Another one with the row at three o'clock, row at three o'clock, row at three o'clock. Sorry for the repetition, row at three o'clock, row at three o'clock. Now I've got five were the Tau uh, Omicron Upsilon of I toy, uh, his, is at 10 to 11 o'clock. And these are the five examples. So if you look, there it is, 10 to 11 o'clock. Here you can't see it, but I know that the rho uh, omega mu come right after the, the, the A toy. So it's got to be here. Here you can kind of make them out right there. There you can see the Tau Omicron Epsilon. And once again, there's the uh, Omicron. Now this is the Athena coin. And as I said, it's a unique die variety. None of the other coins uh, uh, match with it. And it's got the kappa at three o'clock. So uh, once again, it's one of the reasons I have questions about it. I can't find any other dialings. 
This is the funky looking coin where the phi uh, actually touches the wrist kind of here at four o'clock, if you look right there. And that's what you can see in both of these coins, the phi touching the wrist at say four o'clock. And here are the two coins, the one, two. Uh, these four coins all have the uh, sigma epsilon uh, centered on the right wrist at three o'clock. And for the for these four examples, they're all you know pretty nice as these coins go. And uh, one of them has a counter mark, but they all you can see a lot of the inscription. So uh, let's take a look at at these four. There you can see the sigma and epsilon. There's a sigma epsilon. There's a sigma epsilon. And there's a sigma epsilon. And actually on these, it, it really looks to me like the obverse is well, the three the three king side. Uh or um Agrippa. Herod and ET, um, they may be linked as well. They all look very similar to me. Now, the one that's not in RPC4, this is the one that I got from David Hendon. Uh, this is a unique link, but I don't have any reservations about it because here the Kappa, Delta, Eta, Mu Omicron is missing. It doesn't say people. It's here you've got the Atoy, the his, and then you've got Rome. You don't have people of Rome here. Um, so that is a unique uh, variant. Anyway, that's the presentation. I hope you found it interesting. I'm curious to see what people think about my proposal that the class plan side might be the obvious side of the coin. Uh, and I'd like to uh, express my appreciation for having the opportunity to give this presentation, and I'd like to open it up to questions. Rick, this is uh, Peter, and I do have a, a question about the class pan obverse. Um, I don't know enough about Roman coin production, uh, or actually, you know, coin production beyond, you know, really the Greek world, but. Um, you know, certainly with a lot of the Greek coins that I work with, it is possible, you know, looking closely at the coins to uh, determine which sides, you know, what, which is the anvil side, for example, and which is mm -hmm. um, the uh, the reverse die um, side. Is it possible to do the same thing with these coins? And have you looked at them closely to see if there are any indications of, of that sort? I don't have the technical expertise to figure that out. I'd have to show it to a scholar such as yourself, uh, and you're much better qualified and have the knowledge to figure that out. So uh, I think it's something I'd love to see done. The thing is, you know, getting a hold of enough of these to look at them and figure out, can you just tell from one or two examples, you know? Um, yeah. But uh, uh, and and just from you know my also my basic understanding of of this type of coinage, I mean the fact that you have those those standing figures that that is typically more of a reverse type than than an obverse type. So I think in that sense you probably are correct that the standing figures are the reverse type and the class pans are the obverse type. So. Yeah, in the books they typically depict. The, the three kings on the left and the and the class hands on the right and showing the coin. So yeah. anyway, wonderful presentation. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Rick? Yes. Yeah. I have a question about this the status of these uh, Jewish kings in in, in, in the overall Roman imperial system, because we, we seen a certain number of client kings or allied kings at some point of time, like you know Cappadocia or Nabataeans, uh, who uh, strike uh, silver drams or silver tetradrams. 
correct me if I'm wrong, but we, we are dealing with a production of bronze uh, here. Um, so does it say something about the status of, or maybe the, should I say the fragility of that status? What, because it was a Roman province uh, prior to the kingdom extension, became a Roman province again, which means that these kings didn't have a very established um, legitimacy in the eyes of Rome. I think you make a good point. And also, unlike other client kings, well, it may there may be client kings where there are close personal relationships. Uh, the relationships between the Herodians and the Julio Claudians was kind of a friendship thing. So uh, to some extent, maybe it's not necessarily an arm's length political relationship between an emperor and a client king, but it's more like you're a friend of me and mine, I'll let you rule this territory. Uh, but you're correct that uh, they're just bronze coins, no, no silver coins were minted. Obviously, you have a lot of silver coins being minted uh, in the north that can circulate in, in these territories. Thank you. I just once again express my appreciation for the opportunity to give this presentation, and I hope that everyone enjoyed it. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Appreciate it.